The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. This is one of my favorite, favorite lectures for, for 561. And I hope you will like it too. But OK, last time uh, we talked about the hydrogen atom. And it's the last exactly solved problem. And you probably noticed that like the way I treated each of the exactly solved problems, I uh, avoided looking at the exact solutions. I said we should be able to. Uh, uh, build our own picture based on simplifications. And this is something that I really want to stress, that yes, the exact solutions are in textbooks. You can program them into your computers and ask your computer to calculate anything. But sometimes you want to know what it is you want to calculate and what is the right answer or approximately the right answer. And uh, to build insights. Now, in 5.11.2 uh, and possibly 5.11.1 and certainly not 3.09.1, you learned something about the periodic table. You learned how to make predictions about all properties of atoms based on some simp simple ideas. What are those simple ideas? I'm looking for three simple ideas. Yes. Things with like similar valence configurations behave similarly. Yes, that uh, that's sort of a second order s simple idea. Uh, that because uh, I mean it's using the idea that if you know the quantum numbers of the electrons and what what orbitals are occupied, you can make connections between uh, at uh, atomic and some molecular properties. Yes? I think you understand like, the interplay between like, nuclear charge and electric charge. I can derive a lot of physical behavior. Yeah, that's, that's um, I mean, there are things like electronegativity, yeah. shielding. Yeah. Uh, and uh, these are things where, uh, if we have some intuitive sense for how big orbitals are uh, and what is the relative attractiveness uh, to different nuclei of the various orbitals, you build up everything. And it, most of it comes from this lecture. And um, so I'm going to talk about the hydrogen atom as a model for electronic structure. And in particular, I'm going to talk about quantum number shielding, uh, quantum number scaling effects. So, um, and I'm going to be using the semi-classical method a lot. Okay, so we know that uh, the, for the hydrogen atom, you can factor the wave function into an angular part, which is universal. So if you understand it once for any problem, you understand it all the time. And so we can just put that aside because that's a, a done deal. And, and then there's the radial part. And the radial part is different for every central force problem. And so we want to be able to know what goes into the radial part and how to use those ideas to be able to understand almost any problem even problems where there's more than one electron. So I'm going to be making use of the classical, uh, the semi-classical approach where the classical momentum for the, uh, that's conjugate to the radius, in other words, the radial momentum, uh, that that we know what that is. It's related to the difference be between the energy and the potential energy. 
and we get, get, get the uh, momentum from that, the classical momentum function, and that gives us everything because we use the de Broglie relationship between the wavelength and the momentum. And I hope, uh, I hope you believe what I'm going to try to do in the time we have for this. Um, so there are several important things that I didn't get to uh, have time to, to, uh, to do in lecture, and I want to mention them because I probably will write a question on the final connected to spin orbit and stern gerlach So you want to understand those. Okay, so the schedule for today is, suppose you take, uh, you record a spectrum of the hydrogen atom. Now, that spectrum is going to reveal something that, that I regard as electronic structure. Structure in the sense not of, uh, uh, not of bricks and mortar as you would talk about the structure of a building, but what the architect had in mind and what the function of the building was. And so this structure is kind of a mystical thing which in which if you look at a little bit of it, you sort of get the idea of all of the rest. And so here, uh, I'm going to show you how you can approach a spectrum and uh, to know where you are. Because the spectrum can be really complicated. And there are certain patterns that knowing about electronic structure enables you to say, yeah, I've got a Google map. I know exactly where I am. And it's based on some simple ideas. So this is first illustration of structure. Then I'm going to go and deal with the semi-classical methods for calculating all electronic properties of the hydrogen atom. And we get this business of scaling of properties with the principal quantum number. And that extends to Rydberg states of everything, atoms and molecules not just the one electron spectrum. And the Rydberg states are special because one electron is special. It's outside of all of the others. And what we're going to learn about next time when we have many electrons or more than one, we don't have to think about anti-symmetrization. We, we can still take our simple-minded picture of an electron interacting with something. And uh, so we can then take what we knew from hydrogen and describe everything about Rydberg states of molecules. And that's kind of exciting. And this will be followed by the bad news that when you have more than one electron, you have to do something else. You have to write anti-symmetric uh, wave functions anti-symmetric with respect to the exchange of all electrons. And that looks like it's going to lead to a tremendous headache. But it doesn't. But you do have to learn a new algebra. OK, so let's, let's going on this. OK, so for the hydrogen atom, It's easy to uh, solve the time-independent time Schrodinger equation. And we get a complete set of these R, N, L radial functions. Complete set. An infinite number. We don't care. You can take this. It's a simple one-dimensional uh, 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 differential equation, and you can solve it. You can tell your computer to solve it. You don't have to have any tricks at all. You can just use whatever numerical method uh, to find the wave functions and calculate whatever you want. There's no insight there. It's the same thing as recording a spectrum where you have tables of observed lines and maybe observed intensities. You don't know anything. It's a description, and you can have a mathematical description, or you can have a, an experimental description. You don't know anything. You want to have your insight 
uh, uh, telling you what's important and how to use what you know about part of the th spectrum to uh, uh, determine other things. For example, we have two energy levels. Let's say n equals 1 and n equals 2. And uh, there are several things that you would need to do in order to know what the selection rule for L is from this. Because the L, the orbital angular momentum states of n equals 2, are degenerate. And uh, so you, you could use the Zeeman effect. You can use radiative lifetimes. And what, you're going to, what you would find is we have a P state and an S state. And the P state fluoresces to the S state. And the S state doesn't, unless you apply an electric field and it mixes with the P state and it then fluoresces. So there are all sorts of things that will alert you to the fact that there's more going on here than just this simple level diagram. OK. So let's do some elementary stuff and then uh, I'll get to the Google map for the spectrum. OK. We have this thing that makes the hydrogen atom interesting. The potential, uh, the radial potential, is a function of the L orbital angular momentum. And the, uh, the, the radial, the effective potential is given by h bar squared L, L plus 1, over 2 mu r squared. And that's with a plus sign. And we have z e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0, of just stuff from the, the uh, uh, MKS units for the, uh, this, the uh, uh, Coulomb equation. And 1 over r. So we have an attractive thing that uh, pulls the electron towards the nucleus. And we have a repulsion part, which pushes the electron, keeps the electron away as long as L is not equal to 0. So this is the actual effective potential. This is the thing we would use for solving the Schrodinger equation for the RNL uh, of our functions exactly if you wanted to. And first surprise is that the energy levels come out to be for n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. So why are the energy levels not dependent on L? Because this is a, it takes more ink to write this than that. And uh, this can be really important. But there's no L dependence. That's a surprise. It's not true for anything other than one electron spectrum. But it's, it's true. And, it, and it, it has to be, you have to have something that says, OK, for something that's not hydrogen, maybe there will be some L splitting. Why? Why is that? How does th this uh, effective potential have an effect for something other than hydrogen? And uh, we'll understand that in a second. OK. Now there's a the question of degeneracy. So if we pick an L, a value of n, we can have L equals 0, 1, up to n minus 1. That comes out of the mathematics, and I'm just assuming that you can accept that as a fact. OK. We know from our study of the rigid rotor for the, the YLM functions that the degeneracy of the, uh, uh, the L part of the wave function goes as 2L plus 1. Right? If we have an orbital angular momentum of 0, there's the degeneracy of 1. Angular momentum of 1, it has a degeneracy of 3. We know that. OK. 
So if we do a little game and we look at the degeneracies for L equals 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, the, the degeneracies, so G sub L, is 1, 3, 5, 7. Okay, now the degeneracy for N is going to be uh, all of the possible L's. And so for if we have N equals 1, we only have one L, and so the degeneracy is 1. If, for, if we have L, N equals 2, we have P and uh, S, and so we have 4. And uh, uh, for N equals 2, we have uh, I'm sorry, for n equals 1, we have only, well, only 1, and then we have for n equals 2, 4, and for uh, n equals 3, uh, 9. So you see 1 plus 3 is 4, 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 9, and so the degeneracy for n is n squared. So as you go to really high end, you get lots of states. And for hydrogen, they're all degenerate. But if they're not split, maybe, maybe you don't care. Of course you do. I better leave this down. OK. Now, here we are for, suppose you take a spectrum. And suppose it's an emission spectrum. You run a discharge through a gas of, a gas of something that contains hydrogen. And you'll see a bunch of lines. And uh, so one of the things you know is that, OK, the energy levels are uh, separated. They, they go as 1 over n squared. And uh, um, so the energy levels. Uh, well, actually, they're converging, and so let's just indicate that like this. So suppose you ask, well, suppose I'm in this level. There are going to be a series of transitions converging to a common limit from it, and that's a marker, a, mark, a pattern in the spectrum. If you have a, an, essentially an infinite number of levels converging to a fixed point, that's easy to see. And so for each level, there will be convergence to the same fixed point. And so that tells you there's a kind of pattern recognition you would do, and you would begin to build up the energy level diagram and to know which levels you're looking at from the, these existence of convergent series. So if we're interested in the uh, spectrum, we, we have the, the energy level differences, z squared, Rydberg, 1 over n squared minus 1 over n prime squared. That's the Rydberg equation. And, uh, uh, and so this also tells you something. It, so so uh, suppose you're in the nth level. Well, you know this. And now this then converges to the uh, ionization limit. But there's something else, and that is, suppose we observe two consecutive members, n and plus 1. You don't know what n is, but you, because you see the pattern of this convergent series, you can see two levels that are obviously consecutive members of a series. And the question is, what is n? And again, you can solve that. Uh, by knowing that the energy levels go as 1 over n squared, so the difference between energy levels goes as 2 uh, z squared r over n cubed. This is just taking the derivative of 1 over n squared. We get 2 times 1 over n cubed. And so that kind of a pattern 
enables you to say, oh yeah, I know what n is. So this is a kind of a hand-waving, but this is what we do as spectroscopists. We're looking for a clue as to how to begin to put assignments on levels. And because there is this simple structure, which is represented by this Rydberg equation, <clears throat> we can say where we are. We know where we are. We have two choices. One is this 1 over n cubed scaling of the energy differences. And the other is the existence of a convergence of every initial level to a common final level. And that's very important. You can't assign a spectrum unless you know what the patterns are. And these are two things that come out of the fact that there is a structure associated with the hydrogen atom. Okay, now I'm going to have to put some numbers on the board. And it's another illustration of structure. Now I'm just taking things from uh, a table in Macquarie. And this table is a table of expectation values of integer powers of R. And what is this? Every electronic property, anything you would measure, is going to be a function of the, uh, uh, is going to involve an integral involving a function of R. That's what we mean by electronic properties. And, and th these electronic properties have a wonderful uh, behavior. So let's make a little table. Here is the integer power, here is the expectation value, and that's L. Okay, so we start with n equals 2. The, the result you get by actually accurately evaluating an integral, and it, these are doable integrals, they're not numerically evaluated, and they have a simple formula a0 squared, n to the fourth, z squared, times 1 plus 3 halves, times 1 minus l, l plus 1, minus a third. You know, this, these are done integrals. I can't do them, but I wouldn't care to do them. And, okay, so that's, that's uh, how any electronic property that goes as the square of R behaves. We get this. This is the Bohr radius. This is approximately half an angstrom, and it's the radius of the n equals 1 Bohr orbit, which doesn't even exist. Right? There are no Bohr orbits. But we have this Bohr model, which explains the energy levels, and so uh, we use that. And there's nothing else here. Uh, that's the charge on the nucleus. Well, it's one for hydrogen, but uh, there's nothing empirical here. And this is a sort of, it's a fundamental constant now, but it's sort of empirical. And then the next one, it has a, a very interesting initial term, A0 not squared, N squared, over Z. We've lost a power. Here. And it again is uh, one of these complicated looking functions. Okay. This say, uh, R to the one, that's how big an orb a big an atom is, the radius of the atom. And uh, Again, we have a closed form. Notice that the L is present here, even though it's not present in the energies. Zero. That just goes as n to the zero power. That's just a constant. Minus one, minus two, minus three. Well, minus one, that's, the, that's what you have for the, uh, for the, uh, the Coulomb attraction. Uh, and that goes as c over a0 n squared. And for minus 2, that goes as z squared a0 n cubed times l plus a half. 
And for minus 3, we get z cubed a0 cubed n cubed l l plus a half l plus 1. So there are all of these formulas. Well, the important thing is the leading term. And what you discover is that right here, something happens. The leading term goes as 1 over n cubed. Doesn't matter what the negative power of k is, of, uh, of r is, the leading term goes as 1 over n cubed. Why is that? Well, that's really important because this 1 over n cubed behavior is telling you something very important. So here's the nucleus and here is the electron. We can think of it as a Bohr orbit. Uh, if we have a negative power of r, then as you get far, farther away from r, the integral, the value, the property gets small. And so what happens is for ne large enough negative powers of r, the only thing that matters is the first lobe, the innermost lobe of the wave function. And it turns out that's the only thing that matters for almost everything. And so one of the things I'm going to show you is why, why does the innermost lobe matter? And how do we use that to understand everything? Not just about hydrogen, but about Rydberg states of everything. <coughs> so the scaling of electronic properties depending on the power of r, is another example of structure. And if you know one thing about the, uh, the hydrogen atom, if you make one measurement, if you know how to use it, you know everything. You don't have to do all this other stuff. That's a really beautiful example of structure. And this is insight, too. Because sometimes the structure that you have for hydrogen is only approximately valid for other things, and you're going to want to be able to use, know what you can use and know how to modify it. And I guarantee you that nobody teaching a course like this would ever talk about that kind of stuff. Because, you know, it's, it's approximate, it's intuitive, and all the good stuff is tabulated in the textbooks, and you have to memorize it. But you don't know how to use it. And this is how you use it. This is really important. Okay, so now, let me draw some pictures. So this is hydrogen. This is sodium. This is carbon monoxide. So, the electron sees a point charge in hydrogen. That's easy. Now, in sodium, now we don't know yet why, but once I've talked about helium and many electron atoms, you do know, will know why. All of, there are a whole bunch of electrons in the nucleus or in the core of, of sodium. And outside the core, you have something that looks hydrogenic. But there is this core, it's not a point. And that's, that leads to uh, the appearance of L dependence in the energy levels. Because what you're going to find is that L equals 0 penetrates into the core. L equals 1 can't. And so as you have higher and higher L, you're seeing less and less of this. And, and so as a result, there is an L dependence, but it's an asymptotically decreasing one. As L increases, you get less and less sensitivity to this inner part. Now, CO isn't even round. Uh, but there are nuclei, and uh, but if you have an electron in a high enough N, it's outside of this core. And, but again, if you pick L, now you can't have L for something that's not round. 
but if you're far enough away from it, you can pretend that it's round and use the not roundness as a perturbation. And, and so you can have Rydberg states of CO and you can use the same ideas that we develop for the hydrogen atom to explain the Rydberg states of CO, anthracene, um, I don't even know how to say the names of biological molecules, but so, so I just, just consider it. If you had it in the gas phase and you could make a high enough Rydberg state, it would, high enough uh, N state, it would look, uh, following this kind of extrapolation, uh, with features common to hydrogen. Okay, so now, semi-classical. Okay, remember, you can calculate this. Uh, if you want to use rigorous mathematics, you can find an analytic solution for this for hydrogen. And that's good, but you haven't extracted any insight from it. You just have it. Okay, but the semi-classical theory extracts insight. Okay, um, so... Semi-classical theory starts out with writing the classical equation for the momentum. And the momentum as a function of R. Well, that's a no-no from quantum mechanics. You can't ever say we know the momentum as a function of R. And it's also true in quantum mechanics. Whenever you calculate an integral that you need to evaluate uh, some property, you're evaluating it over all space. But what I'm going to show you is that many of these integrals accumulate at a specific point in space, which is a reminder of the classical mechanics. So there are things where quantum mechanics says you have to do something, but there's insight waiting to be harvested because many of the things you have to calculate are trivially interpretable in terms of semi-classical ideas. And the semi-classical means classical. You can do classical mechanics, you can calculate the probability of finding a particle at a particular place, and you can use that information here. And so, always the relationship between the classical momentum function and the potential is so this equation right p squared over 2 mu is the momentum and energy minus potential is the momentum is is the kinetic energy and this is how you get okay so this is the function and the, and so that's one of the important pieces and the other important piece is really unexpected, but wonderful. And uh, so we have this VL of R. If L is zero, the inner wall of the potential is vertical. If L is not zero, the inner wall of the potential isn't quite vertical, but it might as well be, because uh, when uh, when R gets small, the LL plus, uh, when R gets small, even the LL plus 1 over R squared term gets small. And so we get this vertical potential. And so what happens is we can use the idea from de Broglie and say, okay, where is the first lobe? Where, I'm, where is the first node? Well, it's half a wavelength from the turning point. So if we know where the turning point is, we can draw something that looks like, like that. Now it's a wave function, so it's going to be oscillating. So the important thing is that the first lobe, the innermost lobe of all N and L lines up. because this is nearly vertical, and the energy distance from 
here to the bottom of the potential at r not equal to zero is really large. And so if you change n or l by one or two, nothing much happens. And so if you just say, okay, for n greater than or equal to six, six, 36, divide, the Rydberg constant divided by uh, 36 is not a big number, 3,000. 3,000 wave numbers. The vertical distance is more than 100,000 wave numbers. So uh, the correction from n equals 6, uh, so if we have n equals 6, n equals 7, there isn't much change. And so the first lobe is going to always be at the same place. And so one thing that happens is they line up the first node for all n and l is at the same place to a good approximation. And the amplitude in this first lobe scales as n, uh, as, so the amplitude scales at n to the minus 3 halves. I'm going to prove that. This is where all the insight comes from. If you have a property which is essentially determined close to the nucleus because you have a negative power of the R uh, in the, pro uh, in the uh, electronic uh, property, then uh, the amplitude of the wave function will scale as n to the minus 3 halves. And, and, and we can use this in evaluating all integrals because everybody has a, node, has a lobe here at the same point, and the only thing that's different from one state, one NL and another, is the, the amplitude of this lobe, and that goes as one over n, uh, one over n to the 3 f's power. Okay. That's what I was afraid of. Okay. So, we're interested in turning points. And what's the definition of a turning point? Or what is the mathematical equation that tells you how to get the inner nuclear dis the 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 uh, r value for the turning point. Yes. Derivative equals zero. I'm sorry. When the derivative of b l d r equals zero. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for so when the energy is equal to b l of r plus or minus. That's the equation that tells you where the turning points are. And these are simple equations. So it's, it's child's play, adult child, but, uh, uh, to calculate what the inner and outer turning point is as a function of n and l. And so we know the, uh, the effective potential. We pick an energy. We know what it is because it's the Rydberg over n squared. So we have enough to calculate this uh, function, which is a0 n squared 1 plus or minus 1 minus l, l plus 1, over n squared square root. Now I could derive this, you could derive this, but uh, it's a simple closed form equation. And that, that's the foundation of all of this. Now, the thing that's common for everything is the inner turning point, R minus. Because what we're interested in is this. Where is, uh, where is that the maximum, you know, it's, or where is the first node, and what is the amplitude? And so we're going to use this equation to get all that. All 
All right. So the semi-classical theory, lambda uh, nl, that's the wavelength, is equal to h over pr of r. That's the, that's the Broglie, but it's generalized to uh, a potential which is dependent on r, or a momentum function which is dependent on r. <clears throat> so now we have to calculate several important things in order to build our model. One is the classical oscillation period. So if I told you we have a harmonic oscillator, we know the energy level spacings are h bar omega, right? And they're constant. If we make a, a superposition state of a harmonic oscillator, there's going to be beat notes at integer multiples of omega. So we can simply say, well, for Rydberg states or for anything, we can define the period of oscillation as h over in this case, n plus a half minus n e n minus a half. This is the separ energetic separation between levels, not, or even not levels. We have a formula that's giving the independence of the energy. So this is related to the period that we get from the uh, harmonic oscillator. So this is a perfectly legitimate way of knowing the period. Well, when we do that, this is something I derived, I wrote down before. The energy separation of two levels, differing in n by 1, centered at n, is going to be the Rydberg divided by uh, 2n, well, I'll just write it down. So we have h, and now this h, c, r, 2 over n cubed. And n cubed is really important. It came just from taking the derivative of the one over r squared, one over n squared energy dependent. Okay, so this is a formula that's perfectly legitimate. What that tells us is the period is proportional to n cubed. The higher you go, the slower you go. Second, node to node um, probability. So how long does it take? You have this well, and uh, it, I don't mean to draw it like a harmonic oscillator, but it's a well. And so you have a node here, and you have a node here, and you have a particle that's moving. Classically, how long did it take for the center of the particle to go from here to here? That's an easy thing to calculate too, because we know classically what the momentum is at any point in space. The momentum is related to the energy difference between here and here. So what we're going for is the, t the ratio of the time node to node, uh, or to next node, to uh, delta t turning point to turning point. Okay, well, this is one half the period, right? So we know what half, one half the period is, and well, the period was, was goes as n cubed. So. This is the probability of finding the particle within one lobe of the wave function. So we can calculate the probability of finding a prob I'm sorry, yes, the probability of finding the particle within one lobe. And it's clearly going as 1 over n cubed. Now we want an amplitude. 
What is the amplitude? It's the square root of the probability. All of a sudden, we start to see that the amplitude in whatever lobe we want goes as 1 over n to the 3 halves. Now, because we have this lining up of nodes, the first node and the first lobe being identical, what we have now is the scaling of the probability or the amplitude in the first lobe of the wave function. And the next thing is, again, something that's almost never talked about in textbooks, but it's a really fantastic tool for understanding stuff, is suppose we want to know the value of an integral. So we have an integral, and uh, that will be, say, the, the, the electronic, uh, sorry, the electronic wave function in this chi representation as opposed to the RNL representation. Okay. So this is the integral we want, but what we really want is a, a way of saying, I can convert this integral to a number that I can figure out on the back of a postage stamp. No methods for integration, no numerical methods, just insight. So we have uh, some electronic property which comes from this integral, but now this is a rapidly oscillating function. This is another rapidly oscillating function. And so if we were to ask, well, how does the integral accumulate? In other words, let's say we're integrating from my r minus to r prime chi nl of r, r to the k chi n prime l prime of r dr. So if we plotted the integral, the value of the integral, at, 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 as it accumulates. So we're not evaluating the whole integral, we're evaluating the integral up to the r point, r prime point. And what we see is that there is a stationary phase point. where at some point in space, the two functions are sp oscillating spatially at the same frequency. And we already saw this for Fermi's golden rule, right? You have a time integral where you rapidly oscillating functions, and then when the uh, applied uh, frequency is resonant with the, the difference in frequency, we get the integral accumulating. It's the same thing. It's easier. And so, we have this idea that there is a stationary phase point and the integral accumulates from zero to its final value there and then there's just a little, a little dithering as you go out the rest of the way. You get in complications when there are two stationary phase points because then there's destructive or constructive interference between them, but it's very rare that you have two. You only have one and so if you know the amplitude of the wave functions at a stationary phase point, you can calculate the integral as a product of three things. No integral and no integration, just one number. And the thing that we care about is that almost all electronic properties accumulate in the innermost lobe because they're the same. The wave functions are the same and they get more and more different as you go farther out. And as a result, since the amplitude in its innermost lobe goes as one over n to the three halves, and you've got two functions, you've got the nl function and the n prime l prime function, you have that the integral is, pro is proportional to one over uh, n to the three halves, one over n prime to the three halves. So not only do you get expectation values, you get off-diagonal matrix elements. Now this is not exact, 
but it tells you this is the structure of the problem. And if I look at enough stuff, this is really important to say, how does everything scale? And if you know how things scale, you know that if you're combining things that aren't part of that scaling rule, that they're just not going to be relevant. This is a fantastic simplification because, yes, you can do it exactly by programming your computer to calculate the integral numerically. And that's not a big deal, but you don't know anything. And here, you know what to expect. And this is, this is a professional spectroscopist who survives by recognizing patterns and using patterns. This is beyond numerical integrals. These, this is actually understanding the structure of the problem. And the fact that the molecule gives you this beautiful, uh, uh, or the atom gives it this beautiful lobe, always at the same place, you, you know stationary phase. Now there are other problems where you use the stationary phase approximation. You always want to be trying to use stationary phase. For example, and I'm going to stop soon. Suppose you have two potential energy curves. Now you don't know what a potential energy curve for a molecule is yet, but you can imagine what there is. And so they cross. And this is the place where uh, the, uh, at, at this energy, the momentum on this curve is exactly the same as the momentum on that curve. And so the interval accumulates at the curve crossing point. Isn't that neat? If you know what the curve crossing point is, you know the amplitude of the wave function, and you can estimate the, any integral. So this is a, something you would, you would use if you're actually creating new knowledge again and again because it's deeper than the actual experimental observation. It's the explanation for it, and it's, it's what you're looking for and how you use your knowledge of what you're looking for. And that's why I like this lecture, because it really gives you know, the, 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 the approach that I take to all scientific problems. I look for a, an approximate way where I don't have to do any complicated mathematics or numerical integration. I can do that just sitting at my desk. Okay, so on Friday we'll hear about helium and why helium looks horrible but isn't. <laughs>